Hello, good morning, Stella. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Stella. She's the founder of Brainstorm. And um, would you let us know what is Brainstorm? What's your specialty? And there you go. Okay. So very nice of you to invite me. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be able to talk to your community because we've now met a lot of your families and um, we've seen some interesting patterns that we're going to talk about. So a little bit about Brainstorm Health. Brainstorm Health was founded um, seven, eight years ago by myself and it was really with the aim and big vision to be able to offer a multidisciplinary, so different types of services to children with autism and other neurological issues mm -hmm. to not just dismiss them as if they are, they just have autism. And it's just because I, we know it's not good enough that, that children have a lot of comorbid conditions with gut health and lots of toxic metals and um, other systems in the body are not working. So the plan was to create an, uh, a place where people could go um, find knowledgeable practitioners who had a plan, you know, and that there was a program for them to do. Um, and for me, my training is mostly in um, nutritional medicine, but also functional medicine, which is all about getting to the root cause of things. That's all it is. It's nothing more than that. And not just seeing symptoms as um, the, the, the thing we need to get over. Um, and an example I always use is if someone's got a headache, the, the reason for that headache could be dehydration, could be that they didn't sleep very well or they had something to eat that bothered their system. And so the headache is a symptom based on many different reasons. And so that's what we look for. We try and find the reason. So the pra yeah? Um, why do you think when a child, so, okay, sorry. When a child uh, presents some of the symptoms of autism, yeah and the mother takes the child to the doctor at the GP and then probably he'll start investigating but why is it that the, the normal doctor the GP they yeah. don't investigate why is this child not speaking why is this child have a constipation or you know diarrhea or you know the symptoms so why do they dismiss especially if they have a diagnosis yeah um, the, I think the problem is that doctors are given guidance. So they have these nice, they're called nice guidelines. So for them, autism is just a mental health issue and nothing more than that. And everything is put down to that. I actually find a lot of doctors are now testing children if they have constipation issues that are chronic. They do go to, they re get referred to gastroenterologists and some doctors take action, but mm -hmm. some doctors don't because they're not guided to. And I think that's, um, I don't know if you know this, but we have a consultant pediatrician as part of our group and he, he, I, he joined us last year. And the reason was exactly this, that doctors are dismissing all these um, symptoms and not not all of them some of them and not allowing not doing the right investigations and so our pediatrician is there for the really difficult cases where there's medical need required um, but yeah it's a very good question and I think it's changing we're part of a there's a charity I support strongly and I really recommend you guys uh, look at them because they have incredible amount of information for absolutely free uh, it's called Thinking Autism, and, and I do a lot of talks for them. I've spoken at a lot of conferences, and we also have a great Facebook group where you can go and listen to videos for free of many, many professionals who talk about, you know, what we can do to help our children. Um, and I think people like that are really pushing and trying to get the evidence base to be presented to professionals so that the the whole conversation changes. And it's happening very far too slowly, you know, for my liking, but it's happening. And we are working extremely hard, honestly, in the background to make this um, become like a, almost a checklist. If a child comes in, these are all the things that you need to check and make sure that it's okay, like simple stuff, you know, their iron levels and things like that, and make sure all the simple stuff is corrected. What do you think is the cause of autism? Okay, so 
Very good question. Often I get asked this. I don't think anyone really knows. My understanding from the thousands of patients that I've seen is that it is the perfect storm scenario. It is a, a situation where maybe a child is slightly genetically predisposed to maybe not detoxifying very well. I mean, we all have little nuances in our genetics, for example. Um, and that maybe they had too many antibiotics when they were born or the mum had antibiotics or, the, uh, you know, especially group B strep, there's a thing that now they test for during uh, labor and if you you're positive they pump you full of antibiotics i feel that's a big big one antibiotics in the first six to twelve months of life is huge pattern that we see in the kids so is that no? sorry mother, if the mother or the child has an infection then how can it yeah there's happen? nothing you can do but you can then follow up with lots of supportive like probiotics and the right diet and not just do the obliteration of the bacteria and then let everything and not like support it. This is the thing you need to support it. So I think that's, that's possibly, and then for example, that can happen and then the child gets ill and they don't recover very well. And then um, they drink bad water, they are in a building that has mold or there's lead in the pipes or there's copper or and it all just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and then something triggers it, whatever that is, it's an illness or an infection or even a head bang, you know, banging your head, a head trauma can not necessarily give you brain damage but cause that kind of trigger. Um, autism is not genetic? I don't think it is. I think not born autistic. I don't think so. In my experience, what we find is that you can have genetic weaknesses, for example, because you have genetics like your skin is brown, your eyes are brown, your nose is a certain shape. That is a fixed genetic that nothing can change that. There is another whole world of genetics called epigenetics, which is what we specialize in as well and, and test and try and understand which is very controllable you know because it's it changes based on your environment it gets switched on and off based on your toxicity around you your stress levels etc if you're taking medication you know often we find parents have maybe thyroid issues for example that's a common one we see and they take thyroxine during pregnancy we don't, we can't make a connection, but maybe there's something there that you're, the baby can't maybe detoxify the components of that. And so it's all about that sort of underlying genetic that can be manipulated. So creating the best environment you can, you know, through the right diet, reducing toxicity in your environment, um, making sure your child is, um, is, Breastfed if possible, I think that makes a difference to have breastfeeding in the first three months at least makes a difference. We see that, but sometimes I know it's not possible to do that. So just taking normal steps to protect your child at the beginning can make a big difference, you know, to, to the outcome. I don't think, I, th I think there've been two major studies on genetics for like solid genetics for autism. And I don't know if you know about the um, the genome project that's been going on and there's like lots and lots of people who contributed to that thousands and thousands of um, people and I know some of the people in your community have participated in this kind of genetic trial and they haven't found anything and they've tested everything no there's no real pattern you know there there's been a twin study that was done mm -hmm. years back which everyone refers to it was a poor study it wasn't very well structured um it was the the numbers were not significant enough for there to be a significant pattern so i think in my humble opinion having not done a phd in genetics you know uh, solid genetics is that i think there isn't a gene that they that they are ever going to find that is to do with autism there'll be just like nuanced stuff that um that contribute that they're contributors they're not the reason i don't think what is autism when you say like when i when the parent i'm supporting and one of the parents say my child has autism 
Mm. It varies. So what really is it? Is it tangible? It's not, yeah, I mean, in a way, yes, but I feel it's a very poor word that's given to a, ch you, a child who is smearing poo and banging their head and nonverbal can have autism diagnosis. And a child who is functioning in a normal school and ha is just a little bit odd and quirky and maybe they don't have good um, recognition of facial expressions or their social skills are poor can also have that same diagnosis. So we struggle with that terminology because it ge genuinely doesn't mean anything. You know, it's a word that medical people have to give in order for you as a parent to receive number one, a diagnosis, number two, the support you need from the community in terms of sort of speech and language and things like that. So for me, autism, the, it's just a nonsense word. It really is. It doesn't do it justice in any shape or form. But there are some traits, it's like sensory processing difficulties are very common all across the board. Um, social skill issues are common all across the board. Speech can be common in more than half the kids, you know, that they're not articulating properly or that they have processing issues where it's a bit slow and sort of, you know, it, it's not quite as fluid as it should be or their thinking time is slower. So those are probably the things that I find are the most common across the board, but the rest varies enormously. Yeah. The next question. Yeah. What is the, can it be cured? Can it be cured? I think it's like, it, because it's a multi-system issue, and by that I mean many different body systems are affected. You know, we see children, we look at their gut, we look at their something called the mitochondria, which is like a little part of your cell that gives you life, basically. It gives you power for your brain to function, for you to grow, for all these things to happen. And interestingly, that tiny little thing in your cell can only come from mum's DNA. So it's really important for mum's genetics to be massively taken into account when we're looking at a child. Um, and so there could be that there was a detox, like the liver is congested or the lymphatic system is a little bit stuck where you get your white blood cells to fight infections and things like that. It could be that you have, um, you've had, you've picked up a little bit of a yeast infection that's gone, not just in your gut, but systemically all around your body. And sometimes kids get like infections down below or they get it in their mouth, but actually most of the time it's all over inside their bodies as well. And so it's, it's like you have to address every single thing in the right order. This is why the program we created was like playing a chess game because that's how you have to approach autism. You have to see it as you may have to sacrifice a couple of pieces in order to get your end destination. By that I mean, for example, if we commonly see children with a massive yeast overgrowth in their gut, um, and that's also, we check in the blood and it's gone in slightly into the bloodstream as well, or, or it's become systemic. And How does that affect the brain? Because top, um, yeast, along with other nasty kind of bacteria that may have taken over in your gut, we can talk about what all that means in a minute, produce their own toxins in your body. So yeast, for example, produces three types of toxins. It, there's something called acetaldehyde, which is like you getting drunk on alcohol. Yeah. Um, what is that why they seem like disconnected? This is, this is why they're kind of spaced sometimes. And then there is something called gliotoxin, which is like being um, having a mold infection in your body. Um, and then there's ammonia, so which has a massive impact on the brain, but also it makes you very out of balance and your sort of um, ammonia can cause a lot of sort of hand-eye coordination issues or balance issues and... Um, which then it's like put down as if there's something going on with the ears, but actually it's a ammonia, in fact, you know, overload in your system. So what we do is 
we mop up all of that through binders and things like that. We, we put in antifungals. And when I say you need to lose a couple of pieces is when we do that, you can sometimes dip a little, get worse before you get better. But we explain all this to parents and what to expect so they're not surprised by anything. So once we've done that, then you go, okay, so how do we repopulate, you know, this lovely ecosystem that you have in your gut, which controls everything. You have more neurotransmitters in your gut than you do in your brain. Oh. And so up by a mile, you know, by multiple levels. So if you don't have a healthy gut ecosystem, if you've had loads of antibiotics, you haven't eaten right, you've eaten loads of um, foods that have had a lot of toxins and pesticides in, they have a massive impact on the gut bacteria. You don't drink clean water and you drink lots of chlorinated water, which kills bacteria. Yeah, go ahead. Drink the tap water. <laughs> tap water, you know, as long as it's filtered, we have, I always recommend what we have, which is just a under the sink, really good filter. And sometimes a filter for the house as well. They're not expensive. They're, they're very... Can um, you give me the recommendation afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's actually a company called Healthy House, which you can look up online. We don't have any affiliations with them. They just do good quality filters at reasonable prices. Okay. Um, and the whole house one is good for kids who have a lot of skin issues because you don't want them sitting in a bath or having showers with lots of like chlorinated water. Um, but you, you just go through all that and you add all that to the pot. You keep filling this bucket, you know, and at the end of it, we're like amazed that the child has issues. How, how are we amazed? I mean, think about what's just happened. You know, you talk about common knowledge. Sorry. It is common knowledge. It's just that what do you, you know, if you go to a medical, if you go to your GP, the way the medical model is, is that they have a gastroenterologist for the gut. They have a neurologist for the brain. They have an endocrinologist for the hormones. You have the separate systems. With functional medicine, that's absolutely ridiculous. You have to look at everything as a whole. And so our expertise is in all of those areas. So try and understand how they all interact with each other and do it the right way. So for example, if you or your child has a massive gut tissue and they have um, imagine the gut microbiome is like one and a half kilograms of bacteria and they're mostly bacteria a little bit of yeast a little bit of parasites they all live in harmony like the amazon rainforest they're all like a beautiful ecosystem well ha what happens with antibiotics bad water bad food all this stuff or um, toxins etc that rainforest becomes totally like as if it's been like mowed down you know burnt imagine that when human beings go into the amazon rainforest and they take big sections out and burn it off and cut all the trees it's a bit like that and so the ecosystem gets out of balance you know these creatures who are very happy living there suddenly their homes are all wrecked and they have nowhere to live and so they scurry and they go and try and live somewhere else where they're uh, they're not welcome you know they get attacked and it's a bit like that in in your ecosystem that's what's happening when you overload it with all these things um what are the signs of gut issues in children it with doesn't autism? have to be like ibs or SIBO, which is small intestinal back like you when you get really bloated it doesn't have to be constipation or diarrhea i mean they're there they're all there but it can be very low grade where it's just you're producing you know there's three i, I mean we just spoke about yeast and there's three things there mm -hmm. imagine all the other bacteria they're all producing their own little concoction in your body um but sorry what was the question i lost my train of thought <laughs> so yeah i lost it as well sorry that microbiome yes how do you know the child, oh, has the child has so, um what's it, what's important is looking at the gut always we just do it regardless of whether you have all the symptoms or not and seeing if they're underlying infection and clearing them and then seeing neurological issues improve like sleep or uh, focus or um, kids who are like really hyper, you know, they're jumping around all over the shop. They tend to really, really calm down, even though they didn't have major gut symptoms that we would identify as like 
the kid's constipated or has diarrhea. So, so yeah, so you can see it in behavior and you can see it in physically as well, both. One of the parents, I mean, most of them, they will have these issues, which is lack of sleep, the child waking up every two, three hours, very extreme limited diet. Um, they wouldn't eat uh, food, vegetable, you know, very extreme uh, diet and also behavior issues, which is a lot of stimming, sensory issues. And, you know, so would you say all that is being caused by what's happening in the gut? It can be massively contributed by because you have to think about, you know, if I could describe autism in a sentence, and I'm probably going to get chastised for this, but I would say it's a, it's a gut issue, but it's like a neurological issue as a result of an immune activation, okay? Because in your gut surface, from your, from your mouth to your bottom, you have a huge area, and that is where 80% of your immune system is, okay? And so whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you're taking in, is, is the immune system gets activated with whatever goes in, okay? Mm. If, if it likes what you're putting in, it won't get active and cause trouble. If it doesn't like what's going in or it doesn't have the right ecosystem, you know, that you've burnt whole sections of it so it can't protect itself, it starts reacting because it doesn't know what to do. And then that reaction, sometimes it's almost like a domino. That you've knocked this and it just keeps going and going and going and going and knocking lots of other things out. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of before we take the next step, that has to be right. You know, your how do you treat it? So we make sure food intolerances, for example, we check them all, make sure that that's not an issue because that if you your body doesn't like you eating dairy, for example, which is a huge issue for your community, I have to say. If you do one thing, come off dairy, cow milk at least, goat milk maybe, but most likely, I love um, you guys on camel milk. I think it's fantastic. So. Um, but as a therapy rather than just drinking it constantly, you know, mm. as if you've got not to replace milk, milk, but to be like a therapeutic, almost like a supplement. But dairy, if, you, if you're taking dairy and your body's going, Wah! you know, I don't know what to do with this. It will just activate the immune system. All the soldiers will. Why is it bad? Because I think, Number one, it could be, I feel the kids who've had a lot of antibiotics don't cope very well with dairy products because it's just shredded their gut in a way. Um, but also I think genetics come into it a little bit there where you're not genetically designed almost to drink this stuff here, especially this hormone infested garbage pasteurized milk that is in our shops, you know. Even going organic doesn't make a difference. If you really couldn't, one, uh, the only alternative I would say, there's a milk called A2 milk, which is sold in shops, um, which is a, a different kind of protein, which is it's because it's the protein in the milk that causes the trouble. It's an A2 protein rather than the A1 protein. And the A2 protein comes from cows that are brown cows. So you can also Jersey milk, Guernsey milk, you know, those thick creamy milks you find. There are also A2 milks if you can't find a bottle that says A2, but you find Guernsey or Jersey milk, get that. If you can't do anything, do, you know, take those small steps that you can do. And then um, ideally come off it because the sleep is um, unbelievable. Literally, we had one family, all we did was take dairy out of their diet, the child's diet for a while, like a month, that's it. And, we, and this child had been admitted into hospital more than 40 times in a year. And that he didn't have one incident in that time. Started sleeping, started eating, started doing all the right things. Just by that, we didn't do anything else. You know, it's quite incredible, the power of diet. Mm -hmm. So don't underestimate simple steps that you don't need necessarily a practitioner to take. You can do that, but then of course you need someone but to go to. I do believe that if you're not on dairy, the child will have calcium deficiency. Sure, I was about to say. So once you've taken them off for maybe a month or so to see what that's like, then get your help. Go and see a practitioner because that's when the practitioner can do the magic with you, you know, do all the like. Just I also wanted to say that 
uh, I have trained every practitioner in our practice, just so you know, in our method. Mm -hmm. I monitor every single questionnaire, every single health plan, every single lab test that comes through. So please, for your community, not to worry if they don't see me personally. My team are amazing and we all talk to each other literally 25 times a day. So it's, it's that, that we, nothing gets missed, you know, don't worry about it. Um, what was the question again? Calcium deficiency. Yeah, calcium. So um, I think that it would take many, many months of you not having dairy for you to have any issues with calcium. So don't like panic that you take a child off, off that. Also, bone density needs so much more than calcium. It needs calcium, magnesium, vitamin D. It needs essential fatty acids, vitamin K, all of those things to be right. So even when we supplement with calcium um, for children, we make sure there's a very nice balance with magnesium. Otherwise, there are studies that show people who drink a lot of milk actually get osteoporosis more often, which is a thinning of the bones, more often than people who don't drink milk. So mm. we know that, that that's a, like a little bit of a fallacy, but I'm very conscious that children need certain nutrients more than adults do. So we, we manage all that micronutrient and mac, you know, deficiencies and manage, make sure that there are none. Um, and we keep all over it and we test uh, regularly um, to see, not regularly every month, but we test every sort of six months to make sure that the child is in good shape and nothing's happening. But what interestingly we find is that actually all their other minerals improve when you stop taking milk because calcium, when you flood your body with calcium, it blocks iron absorption, it blocks zinc absorption, it blocks certain things absorbing in your body. And before you ask me, there are three things I've noticed in your community that you guys can do so much about. One is significant iron deficiency. You have to, and if you go to your GP and ask for a blood test, make sure you ask for something called ferritin, which is your storage of iron. It is not enough for you to have just circulating iron. Your body will pull from your ferritin, your storage tank, until you're kaput, basically. So you have to see what's left in that storage. And that's when you get a clear picture. If you're planning a pregnancy, make sure your own iron levels are good, that your iron levels are good during pregnancy. That's number one. Number two is vitamin D. It's like, oh my Lord, it is so low in your community. It's outrageous. You know, I don't have particularly dark skin um, and I am outside a lot but I can get very depleted of vitamin D because I have an epigenetic that causes me to need more vitamin D. And, may, and once we look in that epigenetics, <coughs> guys also have that. So make sure your vitamin D level is good and spot so on. Supplement or diet? Um, I think diet is hard. <coughs> you really need sunshine. You can, there are, I mean, eating, sardines for example in a tin that has the bones in will give you some vitamin d having um, oily fish will give you vitamin d you can get it a little bit from eggs you know but mostly it's from being outdoors and getting it and because you guys are living in uh, an, in a climate that is very different to what your genetics are used to and you're not outside a lot and you are to have vitamin d coverage properly you kind of need to have it all over your body um and so you because you, you're covered because of your belief system and it's very very important that you check your vitamin d status before you get pregnant during pregnancy and your kids it's simple please it's a finger prick test you can buy online you can buy it from the nhs it's like 25 30 pounds do it you know you don't have to go to your gp if you're low supplement and whenever you supplement vitamin d it must be d3 and it must be a combination of d3 and k2 and all good companies nowadays have that combination especially if you're dairy free because then your bone issues will be far far less of an issue if you do that there's one we use if if your um, community wants to that you can buy this easily from normal online stores it's by a company called Nutri, N-U-T-R-I, and they have them in drops. They are simple to give. They don't taste of anything. Um, 
and make sure that you manage it really well. Okay, that those two things. The other thing I have found in your genetics, which I wanted to talk about, was that there is a, um, you know, your immune system we mentioned, um, that your immune system is largely the issue here with autism. Can I just interrupt you, sorry. Yeah. You have seen a number of children from a Somali background. Yeah. Probably most of those children are born in the UK mm -hmm. or, you know, outside of Somalia. And what I've noticed from my groups that we have sisters who have both children with autism. We have, um, you know, ladies who have twins with autism. We have, uh, you know, a parent who have three and four children with autism. And this is very prevalent. Maybe there's not enough research on that, but within the past 10 years, this is prevalent. Every two or three families will have one with autism. What is happening to the Somali community from your perspective? Is it the new environment? Is it because we're outside of Somalia? What's happening? I think it's not just Somalians, actually, just so you know. It's like we have certain communities who've moved to this country recently-ish and then you're seeing like patterns emerging in their families so I think I can't I don't know for sure but I feel these are the reasons I feel that coming out of your environment you're eating foods and inhaling air and drinking water that your body is not genetically accustomed to and I think that's the case if I went to live in Dubai and Somalia or you came to live here you know it would be the same for both of us Okay. I would have it there and you would have it here. And I think that sunshine is a big thing, that you're not getting that vitamin D that you need. Because vitamin D is not just a vitamin. It's like a hormone in your body. It's been likened to a hormone. In fact, they're going to change the vitamin D terminology at some point in the future, very soon, I hope, because there's about 50,000 research papers on this to say that it's actually more like a hormone in your body. So it, it, act, it promotes and activates things all in, inside your body. And there is a, some good research showing lack of vitamin D and autism. Mm. So absolutely, it, okay. lack of vitamin D in mothers and autism. Yeah. So that's, I think, huge. I think the iron levels are low in the, I don't know whether it's because of the foods you're eating that the gut gets slightly damaged and not working right and you're not absorbing iron very well like you would do when you're home maybe you know one other thing i've noticed and this is for north Af actually afro-caribbean boys mostly that in your body you have like a, your immune system is made up of many armies okay so you've got the foot soldiers, you've got specialist units, you've got the SAS, you've got the Navy SEALs, you know, you've got all these different units in your body doing different things. Your foot soldiers are called neutrophils in your body that get activated. They're the most common in your system. They get activated against bacteria mostly, okay, bacterial issues. So anything you, in, you take in from your environment, your body just gets activated, cleans it up, sorts it out. I've noticed that that level appears to be genetically low in all the kids we've tested for Afro-Caribbean. And I think maybe what happens is the immune system is not quite as robust as Caucasian. I don't, robust in that it's not, it, it doesn't have that extra element, you know, to cope. And it might be because genetically you never needed it, you know, in your bodies. And of course that's how it is. But I've noticed that. And I think what happens is maybe the different types of assaults on the system that we spoke about, you know, the different bad food, bad air, bad, bad water and all of these things, the body is, the protection is slightly lower, you know, and so it can get triggered easier. That's my observation. I have no research that I can show you, but I've seen it in hundreds and hundreds of tests that we've done. And it's universal. I've not seen one child come in with a normal neutrophil level that we've tested. Now, the, I will preface that by saying that um, obviously we don't have data on so not African Caribbean children who are neurotypical. So I don't know whether this is a autism thing or is it a genetic thing? 
if you see what I mean. Um, but yeah, so that those are the, the, the main things that I think. You saw Somali children and you did those tests. Mm. What are the deficiency or the common heavy metal that you found? Or what did you find from the blood work or the mm -hmm. urine and the stool? So can you just elaborate on that? Yeah, I find a lot of, from the urine, we find a lot of bacterial yeast overgrowth, some mitochondrial disorders that we spoke about, um, and deficiencies generally in folate, B12, uh, B6, those are the, the three top ones, iron, zinc, magnesium as the three top minerals that we see deficiencies in. Um, so that's what we see. In the stool, we find the gut is in a big mess, you know, you find that, that that Amazon rainforest has been scorched, you know, badly, and that we need to repair it all. So what did you and, find? Uh, we find bacteria that shouldn't be there, that have completely overgrown. We find lack of the key ones, like the gatekeepers, you know, in your gut you have a few species that are the like the king kongs of the jungle you know they don't they are the boss and you need the boss there for everyone to behave right and they're missing they're missing a lot like they're very low or we see yeast overgrowth we see parasites a lot and there's nothing to do with being clean or unclean please never think that it is a common thing in the in our country amongst all cultures you know it's just that people don't test to know that they have it and so we, we, we find that often. And we find um, that the, the pancreatic function, like to have enzymes and hydrochloric acid in your stomach to break food down, that tends to be slightly out of balance with them as well, but not always. So from a stool test, that will, that's what we see. We like hair test for toxicity because it's the growth of like, it's an excretion pathway. Very difficult to do urine and blood tests for, for toxicity. It doesn't really tell you very much. Mm. What, um, what heavy metal did you find? Aluminium, huge. Arsenic, huge. Um, we find mercury and lead less, but we find that when we start detoxing, actually those numbers creep up a bit, you know, because we, it's starting to release there because those are such terrible metals in the system that they get, they get hidden by the system. And having high yeast and metals is a common combination because your body tries to protect you. If you and I walked into a factory and we were exposed to mercury, our bodies would immediately pack all that away in our, and cover it with a, like a invisibility cloak, like a yeast cocoon around it. To protect you and that's why high yeast high toxicity is so so much of an issue and when we detox we find kids get really like they they don't feel right because we know that the the yeast is being released the toxins are being released and so we manage it all really well we give binders we make sure that that is all really minimized and you don't have huge like this a journey but a much more just slightly bumpy journey at the beginning um and so, yeah, so we find that and we find, because we look at minerals as well in the hair and they tell us a lot about what's happening hidden. So for example, zinc and copper and mercury and aluminium and silver and cadmium and all of these things, they're all related. So we see what's the pattern. It's not just about seeing high loads of things. It's about seeing a pattern. So yeah, toxicity, I have to say, is huge as well. And I don't know if it's because the exposure is high or is it that they're just not managing to get rid of it because their detoxification is poor. One final question before we end. I know we're running out of time. Um, what's your success rate and what's the parent expectation when they come to you? Okay, so <laughs> success rate varies depending on parents doing what we ask them. And that's a very important thing to say. Because if we work with you and it's a six to 12 month program minimum, you know, the unraveling of what happens with these children is an enormous task. It is not about giving them a zinc supplement or an iron supplement, it really isn't. Um, sometimes when we see children who are younger 
and, and we would have to categorize our success rate based on age as well. The younger children, I hate to say it, they, we do see better results because they have less to untangle. Mm. Um, and, but the older children, it gets, as they get older, it becomes more and more complicated or more and more takes longer. Mm. Uh, it, takes, it needs more action on our part. Um, so if we work with parents, when we work with parents, they work with us. They have regular check-ins check with us. They test properly. They do the diet. They change their lifestyle um, and do all those things. Then the success rate is more than 60, 70%, you know, in terms of really like success rate, like the kid is indistinguishable from, you know, a child who's neurotypical. And sometimes, and the rest would be probably kids who are remaining with some issues, but much, much more muted. And that we haven't, within that six to 12 month time, we haven't quite got there and we need more time with them. So that is, and also it's not about doing that and then going back to your lifestyle. You just, it's a, you have to embrace a new way of living and being, you know, um, and not having a lot of stress in your, or managing stress better. Stress is there. I know you can't help that, but you just have to learn to manage stress and manage all these things as well. So you don't pass it on to your kids. Um, and so I would say, I mean, those are my own guessworks. You know, we have, if we have parents who falter and it's really difficult to, they don't do what you say, they don't change the diet, they don't take the supplements, they don't change their lifestyle, then of course, I mean, we're, we're, uh, it, it's an impossible percentage to give. So if you do the plan, you're, you have an amazing chance of getting your child to be extremely well, you know? And the, all we do, we're not magicians, as you know, all we do is we are very, very good at knowing how to test, what to look for, and how to put the body right. And we, we, we give you that information. And then it's the rest of it is up to you. Um, yeah, and some kids need more. You know, there are, another thing I need to definitely say is, I just check the time here, definitely say is that, you know, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, visceral osteopathy, cranial osteopathy, that type of stuff really, really helps. It's a complement. It's not just going down one path. And again, we are very good at knowing what you need and referring you to the right people so that you get the right support. Um, so I say, you know, it's this path, this biomedical path is for the steely um, focused, you know, that, that people who can handle it. And there's nothing, no shame in not being able to do it. Maybe a person is not in the right headspace right now where they're watching and they're going, oh my God, this is so overwhelming. It's okay. You know, we've planted a seed in your mind and maybe in six months time, you'll be ready. You know, it's okay not to be ready. Don't feel like you're, you're not doing it right just because you're not able to do it right now. But just know that you need a commitment. And if you have it, you know, game on, honestly. Thank you very much. Um, That's okay. My pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.